Yeah, well, thank, thank you all for being here, especially given all the other things that you could be doing. Um, so the work I'm going to talk about today is actually work I'm doing in partnership with my colleagues. Uh, we call ourselves the Networks and Cultural Assets Projects, but there's four of us now. So there's Ross Bembo, who's at WCR, and who's also at ARA this weekend. Our grad student, Kyung Jin Jang Tucci, who's also at ARA. And then we have a new postdoc. Um, so he will be helping us kind of um, translate this work uh, in a way that will be useful for career services professionals who are helping students as they graduate from college. So I actually want to talk a little bit about how we came to this research project, the three of us kind of together, um, because I always tell my undergrads, research looks like this beautiful product at the end that's like really <laughs> intelligible. Um, in fact, this is not what happened with us. We were just three people who met each other, liked each other's work, and decided we would try to figure out how to combine what we're doing. So that's why we've ended up doing kind of this project that is drawing from these three disparate categories of work, including the community cultural wealth framework, which I'll describe in a bit, um, social network analysis, and uh, the career development literature. So I was coming from here to UW-Madison from UC Davis where I was teaching in a doctorate of education program. And so those students, for the most part, they are teachers, they're principals, they're administrators, they're deans of students at colleges and universities. Uh, at that program, the community cultural wealth framework was the most popular theoretical framework for students' dissertations. And for me, there was a very clear reason why that was. Um, most of the students that I worked with identified as people of color. They were also working in schools where a lot of the students identified as people of color. And the community cultural wealth framework is a way of talking about students of color that highly highlights their assets and strengths and doesn't talk about them as being deficient in any way or needing to kind of be fixed by school. So I think this was very appealing to the students there. I started thinking about how can we use this framework to support student or sorry, uh, people who specifically are working on helping students transition into their first careers after college. Uh, I met Ross, who is the PI of uh, Betways. It is like a, now a massive study of veterans in college and their social networks that they use to support themselves in college and also to transition into the workforce. And then Jin is also part of the, um, the CCWT, the Center for Research on College to Workforce Transitions. So she's interested in career development. We thought, how can we combine these three things that we're interested in into one kind of cohesive project? And I think there's actually a lot of theoretical support for using these methods and theories together, which I'll try to convince you of over the next you know, few minutes. Uh, so what I want to do today is just talk about what the community cultural wealth framework is. Just as an audience kind of poll, how many people have heard of the framework before? Say a few people? OK, so maybe it's worth like talking about it in more, in more depth. Um, so I'll talk about its origins, I'll talk about its current use in the literature, and kind of try to make an argument for why it could be and should be used with social network analysis, including kind of the implicit descriptions of social networks in the original formulation of this theory, our evolving methods as we've pilot tested, post-pilot tested, and are currently like rolling out a full study, and then kind of what we've discovered along the way about the link between students' social networks, their career values, and their community cultural wealth, I'll call here CCW. Um, and then finally, I'll talk a little bit about our current project, which is you know, currently underway. We're collecting data as I speak in the University of Texas system in partnership with some engineers who are interested in increasing the number of Latino students who have PhDs in Texas in STEM. Okay. But I want to start by talking about kind of the origins of the CCW framework because I think it's, it's um, useful to talk about how these scholars were communicating with one another. So the CCW framework is created by Chicana feminist scholars, basically who are reading Bourdieu. Um, and here this is like this kind of famous quote from Bourdieu that's a little bit um, difficult to untangle, but I will read it anyway. So by doing away with it, giving explicitly to everyone what it implicitly demands of everyone, the educational system demands of everyone alike that they have what it does not give. This consists mainly of linguistic and cultural competence and that relationship of a familiarity with culture, which can only be produced by family upbringing when it transmits the dominant culture. Right? So here, we're just basically arguing that schools reward students who already know how to or understand the dominant group's rules about how to talk, how to behave, how to engage with authority, what to wear, read, listen to, etc. And so bodily markers, material objects, formal ac academic credentials, and these tastes and dispositions combine to what he calls cultural capital, right? And interestingly, if you think about like when Bourdieu first started writing about this, which is arguably like in 1966, this is also around the time of the height of the Chicano movement. 
And so this is, you know, the time when students in LA and at colleges and universities and in high schools and colleges and universities were basically demanding better funded schools for themselves where there was bilingual education um, and pedagogy that reflected their experiences and strengths as Chicano students. And so there's a very clear connection actually between Bourdieu's critiques of schools and these Chicano students' critiques of schools, which is that we are already enough the way we are, but our schools reward students who have different kinds of knowledge and skills and dispositions than we do. But doesn't, you know, it's not intimately connected to our inherent worth as students, right? So um, there's a very easy way to read Bourdieu as having a critique of schools that is very similar to the way Chicano students were critiquing schools. And so, of course, these Chicana feminist scholars were, you know, reading Bourdieu and, and offering the same critiques. I think the unfortunate thing is that, as with much social science research, sometimes concepts are taken from their original authors and used in ways that they were not originally intended, right? So in this case, um, you know, Bourdieu is very obviously offering a critique of schools, um, as are the women who are reading him, at, at, you know, when they, when they created this framework. But, um, you know, it's... Cultural capital has too often been used now as a critique of students themselves, right? We need to give students the appropriate cultural capital, meaning dispositions, tastes, and norms, orientations to schools, way of communicating to teachers, and that college should be part of that, right? We should take the wrong things that students have, take those things out, and fill, it with the, fill them with the right things, or maybe think of them as empty vessels who have no cultural capital, and so we have to fill, fill them you know, with, with that. So here's just an example of kind of how, in, in my field, a lot of the writing is centered around what students lack, right, and the capital they lack. So this is a description of a program in the UC system that says, this program addresses students' lack of middle and professional class cultural and social capital, socialization to the academic community, networking, and the opportunity to practice these new found skills and dispositions. So here again, the emphasis is on deficiency of the students and the idea that schools need to help them replace things that they, they don't have, right? Um, in contrast, the community cultural wealth framework uses the word capital in the same way Bourdieu does, but to highlight assets that students derive from their families, cultures, languages, and communities of origin. And these are assets that help them navigate spaces that were not originally designed with them in mind. So for example, predominantly uh, white universities. So here's just a depiction of the community cultural wealth framework. I hope you guys can see it. It's like very small, I see now. Um, but there's the original six forms of capital that Yoso lays out in her paper. Um, and we've added a seventh from Rendon, which is spiritual capital. We've actually found to be linked to students' uh, work volition. So their sense that they'll be able to choose their future job. So that's why we included it. It's actually quite an interesting one. Um, so here I'm going to read a little bit because I could talk about these a lot. So I want to restrict how, how, much I, how much I'll say. Um, okay, so just to describe them very briefly, aspirational capital refers to students' hopes for the future, which drive them to pursue their goals even in the face of obstacles. Familial capital encompasses knowledge, orientations, and practices that are passed on by families. And this also includes fictive kin, right? So the idea of like creating a family in your, in your school or in your workplace, right? Linguistic capital includes the ability to communicate in more than one language or style. And what we found is that our original measures split into multilingualism and also code switching. So these are two kinds of linguistic kind of uh, tools that students have. Navigational and resistant capital are closely linked concepts related to students' ability to recognize and challenge injustice um, and also to navigate institutions that perpetuate inequality. So that's navigational capital. And here, social capital is used in the same way it often is in social science research, but the focus here is on what they call non-dominant cultural capital. So for example, um, Kiyama has a, um, arguments in her paper that su suggest that students of color, even if they don't have college-educated parents, are sometimes linked to universities in unexpected ways. They might have a person who works on campus, and therefore they actually have like some familiarity with campus, right? Um, similarly, there are ways that students are linked to schools, even if it's not through teachers. It could be through teachers' aides or bilingual teachers' aides. It could be through janitorial staff or cafeteria staff. And that these are ways that students use connections to form familiarity with their school spaces. And then finally, um, spiritual capital is this feeling of being kind of guided by a higher purpose, either from God, a religious faith or community, or a general sense of spirituality, but a faith that kind of um, uh, supports you as you're working through your educational uh, journey. 
So um, while this theory was originally formulated with students of color in mind, it's been used quite often since its publication in 2005 for a variety of student populations who are considered quote unquote marginalized in, in higher education. Um, and it's been expanded to include different kinds of community cultural wealth that are important for different sub-communities, right? So there's a mat maternal cultural wealth, which is, highlights the specific role of, of mothers in providing material support for their children going to college and uh, kind of aspirations for their achievement. So since so much has been written on CCW, my first goal was just to read as much as I could about the underlying concepts in college in order for us to create uh, quantitative measures of community cultural wealth. So to do that, you kind of need to know like what's been written about it already. So I read um, about 90 articles that have been published between 2000. I, I've been doing this over, over time. <laughs> um, so I didn't realize that was so, that was so shocking. I've been, I've been reading a lot over time. The great thing is, the, like, if you look at the trajectory, I hopefully have a paper coming out on this soon, the number of articles has just been increasing in the last like decade. So the first decade, it didn't get that much attention, and then it's been speeding up quite a bit. So we have new ones coming out like every, uh, every day. Um, so I just want to tell you, I'm not going to tell you what those 90 articles said, but just a general overview of kind of the big themes in, the, in these articles. And again, these are articles that um, uh, are about college students specifically and either how they're navigating college or the transition to college. So obviously, families uh, inspire students to pursue higher education, particularly in terms of family histories. I'll show you an example of this in a moment. Uh, students... Uh, report that experiences translating for family members outside of a school context helps not only with their language development, but also with their audience orientation. So just their general communication skills beyond like actual bilingual or multilingualism. And then students also report that because they are often marginalized on campuses with large um, white student populations, that they have developed skills for building family-like relationships in college, and that those family-like relationships also help them uh, connect to an alumni network that's outside of, of campus. So these are kind of like some very you know, um, positive ways that students are using their community cultural wealth to navigate college. So here's just an example from a student um, interviewed by Perez Huber who um, talks about how her familial capital supports her in college. So she says, I always see my dad working. When I was little, he would work seven days a week and it bothered me so much because he could never spend time with us. Now I'm older, I see my dad's hands and they're not soft. And so when I see his face and his hands, I'm like, ugh, this is the reason why I'm going to school. I just see how much he works and how brave they were to come here and it motivates me. This is a very common story that we hear also in our interviews with students that um, familial history, and not, and not mean just your ancestry, right, but what your parents experienced, what your grandparents experienced, um, helps you kind of have a different perspective on the challenges that you're facing in college, right? It supports you uh, through that. The one thing we also noticed is that community cultural wealth is very clearly tied to career interests, even though not much of the literature is on career development and community cultural wealth. So, for example, Rincón has this great set of articles on how students develop exposure to STEM through parental careers, even if those uh, careers are not bachelor's, you know, not bachelor's required. So things like construction or technician positions that require some kind of knowledge of material science, students report getting an interest in engineering, uh, in, in, um, in, in, a, in a architecture through uh, fields like this, right, through early exposures to their parents' jobs. Students also describe uh, being interested in service-oriented jobs that help pay forward, you know, uh, what they've received in college. So that might impact kind of the jobs that students are choosing after college, whether a company or an industry has a, has a service-oriented perspective. And then finally, a lot of students in other articles report, you know, being interested in high-paying jobs that allow them to pay back their families or support their families after they finish college. So here we see that there's very clearly a connection between the community cultural wealth that students have and what they are choosing to do with their lives after college. But um, what we found interesting when we were looking through the literature is that the framing of a career path matters a lot. So um, I always hate saying this because uh, we're in academia, right? But the professoriate is a really interesting, an interesting one. Um, on the one hand, it could certainly be framed as a service-oriented job where you're um, you know, uplifting a community or supporting students or, you know, being a representative of your group uh, in a place where you're not, you know, there's not that many uh, people who look like you. 
but the framing of the career path matters a lot. Um, uh, Rincon has found that a lot of students describe now being interested in PhDs or interested in the professoriate precisely because it feels removed from their communities and what, and what they're experienced there. So here there's a student who says, no, he is a chemist, I think. So he wants to be a teacher, like a high school teacher, uh, because I feel like I can really impact those students. But in college, I'm probably going to be teaching kids who like, really don't have anything to lose, so I want to make an impact. I find a lot of people make an impact on me, and that's why I wouldn't see myself being a professor. But I would consider a PhD, right? So um, here there's like an interesting idea that maybe we're um, losing some students who might be interested in the professoriate because it's not framed in a, um, a way that's like service-oriented, right? Oh, yes. I wonder, does that vary by the type of institution? I, would, I was wondering, like, yeah. the more teaching-focused institutions, yeah. I don't know because this is all qualitative data in the, like that she collected at the same place. But I think that's a really valuable point, right? Like, if this person were teaching more, maybe they would feel differently. Well, but it also know. seems like it matters who they're teaching, right? right? So, like, maybe in a community college setting, can make a big impact. They, he might feel different. She might. Yeah, different. yeah, yeah. Okay. I think this is a really interesting point that we've heard come up in our interviews as well when people talk about what they're going to do with their PhD. <laughs> It's kind of, yeah. Um, so the, the limitations of the literature are, you know, it's a vast literature, so not a, not, a, not a lot, but these are the things that we think are useful for our research. So there are very few quantitative instruments measuring community cultural wealth. This is a critical race theory, so it makes sense that what is um, being highlighted here are students' voices and their narratives of their own story. But we also think that maybe not quantifying these measures loses some opportunities to see how these forms of assets, like these strengths, are associated with certain outcomes for students on a large scale. Um, it also means it's difficult to combine with social network analysis. So um, yeah, so there are some, there are some exceptions, right? Sabnan is a, a, a paper that we draw a lot from in a construct, constructing our own instruments. There's also very little on CCW and career development. And then finally, there are, are very rare mentions of how students combine their community cultural wealth with, with what Bourdieu calls dominant cultural capital. So there's uh, this great paper by Kalori which suggests that students are not either only having their community cultural wealth or dominant cultural capital. Instead, they're kind of knitting these assets together to, to thrive in schools. And so here's a great example that's quoted in this paper that suggests, uh, this is from a teacher who works with um, native Alaskan students. And she says, you know, this is her describing how you combine kind of your community knowledge with school knowledge. So we listen to the way people talk, not to judge them, but to tell what part of the river they come from. These other people are not like that. They think everybody needs to talk to them, and they have a hard time, uh, talk like them, and they have a hard time hearing what people say if they don't. We have to feel a little sorry for them because they have only one way to talk. But we're going to learn two ways to say things, like the way we talk about things in our community, but also the way that you're kind of expected to talk about things in school. And so Kalori is arguing that we need to have more information about how students you know, choose which capital to activate when um, and how they're combining these forms of, of wealth um, to, to kind of persist in school. OK, so uh, we thought to ourselves, there is quite a rich um, there's quite rich support for this idea of combining social network analysis with community cultural wealth. And that's because Yoso is very clear in the original formulation of this research that students' wealth comes from other people, right? Their families, their aspirations come from their friends and their communities. So aspirations are developed within social context, often through linguistic storytelling and consejos that offer specific navigational goals. So these are with other people. And given that, social network analysis is an understanding of what other people bring you. We think that it's fine to combine these things. So what we've been doing is we've been drawing students' ego net network diagrams. Should I, how many people already have like seen a lot of these and, um, or like seen them before? Okay, so maybe I should talk about what they are. Um, ego doesn't mean uh, like the person has an ego. It's just, <laughs> um, this is in contrast to uh, social networks where you map the entire social network, meaning you ask each person in the social network who they talk to, and the tie has to be reciprocated. So if I say, oh yeah, like we're friends, and you say, no, we're not, then the tie <laughs> doesn't exist, right? <laughs> so this is, this is completely self-report of the, of the central person. 
but we ask students who they talk to about academic and career related matters and then we can see how those people are connected to each other so like this is i drew for myself like my mom my cousins and my aunts and stuff so um you know these people they talk independently of me and that is useful potentially because they could talk about me when i'm not there like what support does nidia need or we're concerned about her right so we can measure all sorts of features of students networks the density the homophily in terms of gender, race, or education level. We can also measure the strength of ties and the density of their networks to see what features of the network are connected to certain forms of community cultural wealth. So um, I found that students actually seem to enjoy like seeing their networks in interviews because they don't always uh, realize like what they're getting from people uh, that they talk to every day. So this is what we did for our pilot study. We decided to focus only on uh, students who identify as Latino or Latino, um, just to begin with. Uh, and we wanted to know how much community cultural wealth they report through our quantitative measures. We also wanted to see how their CCW was related to their network characteristics, like the, the features of those ego networks. And then third, we wanted to see how CCW associated with work volition and career values. Work volition is just a way of saying um, that you feel like you can choose the job that you want in the future. And that's actually connected to a lot of very positive job outcomes, including persistence in your job and satisfaction. So that's why we want to measure it, because it means that students feel like they're going to be able to do a job they want to do after they graduate from college. So we surveyed 129 Latina Latino undergrads who are attending a PWR in Wisconsin, not this one, a different one. <laughs> um, I am leave, like, we, we did survey students here too, but I'm leaving this one anonymous. So we interviewed 20 of them, but most of what I'm going to report here is our quantitative data. So uh, we gave them CCW items, which I'll show you a couple examples of. We also had them draw out essentially their ego networks. Uh, and then we asked some career development items. So uh, the reason that I think it's appropriate to talk about these students here at this workshop in this context is that these are students who are experiencing um, kind of uh, financial instability in college. So 81% of them report having financial concerns in college. 53% of them are working at least 16 hours a week. 74% um, of them identify as first generation college students. So these are students who are kind of striving for upward mobility and understanding the support they have in doing that is, is, uh, is, is very important. Um, this is a uh, um, highly Mexican-American sample, which is kind of consistent with the population of Latinos in, the, in this area of Wisconsin. Okay, so these are kind of what our community cultural wealth questions look like. This is our scale for familial capital. So like, I feel a responsibility to make my family proud. I receive support from my extended family members, like aunts and uncles. My family members have taught me lessons that are valuable for my education. I have role models in my family. And my family's history inspires me to pursue my educational goals. So this is kind of the, the style of questions we're asking them. To get at their social networks, we ask them to list the names or initials of up to six people that they talk to every day about academic and career, or have talked to about academic and career related matters. And then we proceed to ask them like a variety of questions about these people. One of the types of questions we ask is what kinds of support they receive from people. So we ask them to click next to the box each person who gives them material aid. So that's like, that could be anything from like watching your own children while you go to class to helping you, you know, buy food, maintaining hopes and aspirations, you communicate to about important worries, model for you ways of caring and coping. So some of these are directly related to CCW and other items are items that are just like very consistently used in classic social network research. So we wanted to combine again this new form of community cultural wealth with dominant capital, which includes material aid, uh, uh, sharing about important worries, etc. I hope that makes sense. So it's we're using our new kind of CCW framework with older social network measures. And then we ask them a lot of questions about these alters. Um, so for the sake of time, I think that clock is right. I'm just going to go over four findings so I can show you like what else we did. So unsurprisingly, students have very high forms of, of CCW. Um, so you can see here that 29% uh, of respondents scored above a 4.9 across uh, all, all of these forms of CCW. And the scale only goes to six. So that's very, that's very high. 
But uh, through cluster analysis, we found that there are some variations, right, which is important to note. Like, these are all Latino students, but there's a lot of, you know, heterogeneity in Latinidad in what students are experiencing and what resources they're drawing from. So you can see, for example, there are students who uh, have lower linguistic capital, probably because they are not, you know, multilingual. Um, there are also students who don't have as much spiritual capital, probably because they're not, you know, they're not particularly religious. There's also an interesting group of students you can see here, um, uh, what we call ambitious. We always try to use like very positive labels <laughs> for the students. Um, is uh, th this group of students? Uh, so actually, resistant capital split. Uh, resistant one is belief uh, that there is a um, belief that there's injustice in the world, and number two is a sense that you want to improve the world to make it a more just place. So interestingly, you can see that there are students who don't necessarily believe that there's a lot of injustice in the world, but still want to work to make the world a better place. That's a consistent, you know, worldview. So we can see some differences in kind of the community cultural wall students have. The other finding that we noted is that students, academic and career support networks are very family heavy. The only reason this is remarkable is because we ask them who they're talking to about academic and career related matters and their family members tend to not be college educated in this sample. So they are still turning to people who have never been to college to get advice about college, which I think is, you know, perfectly intelligible. Um, this, the people in these networks are also doing a lot of heavy lifting for the students. So 73% of contacts provide them with three or more kinds of support. This is lower than previous social network research, which suggests that each person in your network is giving you about three different kinds of support. So again, that's that material aid, that hopes or aspirations for the future, et cetera. Um, so it means that each person in these students' networks is giving them, is giving them a lot. We also noted that student social networks impact or are related to their forms of community cultural wealth. So students with larger social networks report higher levels of aspirational, navigational, familial, and spiritual capital. There's actually a lot here, so maybe I will um, talk about two that I think are quite interesting. Students with denser support networks, meaning the people in their network know and talk to one another quite a bit, they report higher levels of aspirational capital. So that means like having people in your network who talk to one another kind of gives you a lot of like emotional and social support in college. Also, contrary to kind of previous sociological findings, we noted that students who are closer to their contacts, who say like, I feel very close to this person, they have higher navigational capital. A lot of you probably know that famous paper in sociology, The Strength of Weak Ties, which suggests that weaker ties are actually more useful for you in navigating educational and career you know, spaces. But remember, these are students who are students of color and they are at a predominantly white institution, which means closer ties are actually helping them navigate those spaces. Uh, I will skip this for now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, uh, very silly did not collect that information in the survey, but we did in interviews. So we n noted that actually m most of the students that we talked to in our interviews were from Milwaukee. So uh, I guess you don't know where this institution was. So this institution is about, like um, an hour away from Milwaukee. So. Um, I, I think, yeah. So they are uh, going home sometimes, but a lot of the students in the interviews describe not wanting to go to UW Milwaukee, uh, purposely to like have a different experience. But we don't know from the survey sample like where they where they're from originally, which is unfortunate. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the last thing I wanted to know is that students' work volition, so that sense that they'll be able to choose their job in the future, uh, is positively associated with their spiritual capital their resistant capital and their aspirational capital. The spiritual capital one is interesting because we think this might be connected to students' sense that their work is a calling, right? We saw that in the interviews. A calling means that you're basically, think of your work as serving uh, someone bigger than, sort of something bigger than yourself and that you're being called to it by some higher power, right? Um, and that is, in previous literature, connected to work volition. So there might be kind of so like a path here where we're, these students are thinking of their work more as a calling, although we don't, we don't know. Okay, so uh, this is um, what I want to talk about now to get some of your feedback on 
um, because this is the part that's like been very sticky for us. So again, we think it's valuable to try to quantify community cultural wealth. But there are a lot of like tricky kind of controversial elements to quantifying a critical race theory. Um, so please bear with me as I talk about some of these. The first is that we notice is that it's, these are theoretically intertwined concepts. So that quote that I uh, showed you of that student who said that she gets a lot of inspiration from her family, you could argue that that quote represents both her aspirational capital and her familial capital. So when you're trying to quantify kind of theoretically connected concepts like this, you get a lot of mess, right? So we saw in like our factor loadings that sometimes resistant capital, aspirational capital, and navigational capital items kind of loaded together. And this has happened to a lot of, a lot of other people. We also think that our measures don't necessarily capture some of the nuance in the CCW constructs. Our colleagues at um, Searcy at the University of Washington are trying to do the same thing as us. They have an 80 item scale, which we, we cannot do to our students because our social network uh, section is so heavy, right? So we cannot have a scale that big, but we are not catching the same nuance as they are, right? So um, that, is, that is a problem as well. The, the stories from students are very rich, the qualitative narratives, and we cannot capture that same nuance with our, with our instruments. We also found that social network responses, uh, questions are really tiring for responsin, respondents, and um, college students are smart, and so they will, skip, they will skip it if they figure out that they can cut the survey by you know, 30% and still get their $25 at the end. Um, so we had uh, quite a few people, I'm gonna try to find the number, um, 30% of people said that they did not talk to anybody about anything. <laughs> and that seems, that seems very low. So we, we're trying to figure out ways to get around this. Um, we are now using um, a random generator so we can ask students about a lot of people and then uh, randomly select a set of six people that we ask them more detailed questions about. And this is the part that I think is quite controversial and that, you know, I don't, we are still struggling with how to deal with this. Um, none of these items have been tested by us or anyone else in, who's working on this with white students. So we don't actually know how white students are scoring on measures of aspirational capital. The question is, if this is a construct created for students of color to highlight their strengths, what happens if white students are scoring exactly the same as students of color on these items? What are these items actually measuring then? Right? Um, so to address this, this is what we did <laughs> talk to UW-Madison undergrads. We went ahead and refined our instruments through our pilot test. For example, our code switching questions were just awful, like they did not test well. Uh, it is extremely difficult to measure code switching in a survey. And uh, our questions ask students if they feel comfortable talking to people of different races, educational backgrounds, etc. cetera. Uh, we turned, interestingly, to the feminist conversation analysis work of the 1970s, where feminists were saying, Sure, men feel comfortable talking to us. The question is, do we feel comfortable talking to men, right? And so here, we wanted to actually, instead of gauging comfort, which every, you know, everyone reported, yeah, yeah, I'm comfortable talking to everyone, is experience talking to people of different groups, right? So we're trying to wordsmith these things to kind of to make them measure the construct a little bit better. We also had lots of conversations with other scholars who are developing these scales. We added uh, dominant cultural capital scales as well because CCW is in communication with that kind of dominant cultural capital literature. We wanted to see how students were scoring on very traditional measures of dominant cultural capital. And we also added a perceived barrier scale, which I'll mention in a second. Oh, and as I mentioned, Jin is an amazing programmer for Qualtrics and discovered a way to randomize our name generator. So now we can ask students about up to 30, to list 30 people in their social network. and. and only capture a subset of really detailed questions for six of them. Okay, so we had um, some amended items as well that capture more of the nuance in CCW. Uh, here's an example of our dominant cultural capital question. So we use a lot of the ones from DiMaggio that are just like the standard. How many books did you have growing up? Did you go to art museums, college visits, etc.? These are very common in sociology. But we also wanted to add, it, add like Calarco's idea that dominant cultural capital is actually passed through parental uh, engagement in schools and that parents are you know, showing their children how to interact with authority by interacting with their schools, right? So we have questions about kind of the level of parental and type of parental engagement in schools to capture that kind of nuance in dominant cultural capital. Yeah. Sure, so there's a question about the other work sure. happening. Mm 
I would think that would vary geographically, like somewhat right. dramatically, based on the demographics of a given state and the yeah. politics of a given state. So I just wonder how you're thinking about that. Yes, uh, I think we'll, we're hoping to kind of build a body of work that's very comparative. So our current um, data is being collected at the University of Texas system. And uh, it's eight schools that either are HSIs or emerging HSIs. So they're Hispanic survey institutions. We had an interview question that just did not work the same way that it did in the Wisconsin context, which is, do you feel comfortable in class? Um, in Wisconsin, students said, no, I'm the only Latino student in my class. I sometimes feel like I have to speak for all Latinos. You know, that kind of, those kinds of themes. In, uh, at HSIs, it's real, it still works, but the answers are different. Um, I'm a woman, I walk into my engineering class, everyone is a man, I feel extremely uncomfortable. I'm Mexican, and a lot of people here are Mexican-American, and Mexican-Americans are really different from us, and they have different values and culture and ways of talking. So you still get at these senses of students, like um, their differences and you know, the challenges they're experiencing, but uh, in a context where 87% you know, of your classmates are Latino, the answers to some of these things are gonna be really different. So hopefully we'll have enough of a body of literature that we can talk more about the institutional context. But we're still, you know, we're still gathering that. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I'll just say very quickly, like kind of what we found, so they have time for questions. Um, so students of color scored high, significantly higher on our measures of resistant capital. So the sense that the world is not a just place. They also tend to be multilingual. They also uh, scored much higher on what we call extended familial capital. This is something we added in response to like more nuance in capturing CCW, which are uh, items about feeling connected to your racial or cultural community on campus, even if you don't know those people individually. So feeling like you uh, feel like a kinship with other students of your background. Um, white students for, you know, may not have felt comfortable answering that from their racial identities, but they did not score as high. Uh, in the sense of feeling like a part of a larger family or community on campus related to their race. But white students did score significantly higher on dominant cultural capital, so uh, those questions about the possessions they had growing up, their exposure to college through visits and tours and other things, and also how involved their parents were in communicating with their teachers in K-12 education. Otherwise, there were no significant differences, which means that there was something about how we were measuring community cultural wealth that did not capture the kind of um, experience of being a person of color in the United States. I think that, that communicates the complexity of trying to answer these questions quantitatively. Uh, one thing that we're trying to do is amend our items one more time. And also think about this, uh, Jin, our grad student did this wonderful drawing to try to like, <laughs> we were talking a lot and we we're doing little doodles, but she kind of put this drawing together. The CCW framework is explicit in that these assets are coming to students despite the fact that they may be receiving messages to the contrary from a broader society, right? So here it's aspirational capital, the ability to maintain hopes even in the face of real and perceived barriers. And here, you know, you also use this idea of like holding on to hope. Like even if you're receiving messages that people of your, from your community are not professors or are not you know, scientists, you still maintain that hope that you can be a scientist, right? And so uh, what we're kind of thinking is that perhaps, you know, students who have not received those messages about their group are starting with kind of a certain level of hope about their futures, where they're, you know, it's being communicated to them, like, yeah, sure, you can be a scientist. Of course, the people who look like you are in leadership positions in government, right? And so the kind of the level of hope they need to maintain is a little shorter than a person who is growing up in a society where they're not receiving those same messages. And so the question is like, how can we measure this gap, uh, if that makes sense, in, the, in, the, in the, the level of aspiration you have? And so one thing we're thinking of doing, which is uh, a little bit controversial, is creating a composite index. So basically saying you cannot understand these scores on aspirational, resistant, and navigational capital without also including the barriers that students have experienced in their lives. So we ask students about barriers that they have faced, and we are thinking of different ways to combine that with their CCW scores. If you look at the barriers students face and add that to the scores, they do become, the differences become significant. 
But it's quite a, <laughs> um, I think we're worried, we're always, we're going to present this at ARA on Saturday, and we're always worried, um, kind of suggesting that we should consider students' challenges and their kind of assets in the face of challenges. Because it does mean that uh, certain students of certain racial groups will score lower. And we are trying to do like diversity, equity, inclusion work and making the suggestion that like, you know, white students are not scoring as high, like could be, you know, could be controversial. We've had people kind of push back on this idea. So I'll stop there for now. If you guys have questions about um, kind of like the future work we're doing with the University of Texas, I'd be happy to talk about that too. But. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Yeah, so we have like a perceived barrier scale. Okay. Um, I can show you like one part of it that I put up here. So it's um, students reporting things like uh, their experiences on campus, like they're treated with less courtesy, respect, receive poor service. And here, again, this is their perceived barriers. But it's the sense of like whether these barriers are real or perceived, students are experiencing that kind of like emotional weight in college. So this is one way in which we measure it. And basically, there are different ways to like create these composite indices that we're considering. Um, but there are just two here that I'll put. So like you can multiply the normalized CCW with the normalized perceived barrier scale. Or you can use the geometric mean. But the idea is that essentially we're, we're considering the fact that students like have these aspirational scores, even though they're reporting that they're not treated with respect on campus. right? So. Uh, we think that there's theoretical support for this in the original framework, that it's always their goals and assets, even though they've experienced certain things, if that makes sense. Yes? Yeah, so a couple of comments and then a question. So first, yeah. like, I've been around IRP for a long time, and I've seen a ton of these talks, and they've all been fantastic. Mm -hmm. This is probably the first one that's really spoken my deeply personal in the academy. So thank you for that, because I think if it affected me in the way that it did, I know that it will affect students here in similar circumstances in the same way. So thank, thank you for that. Not only is this research, but it's also inclusive and helps, I think, some students identify that there's a place for them here. So that is an unintended consequence, or maybe an intended one, that I just wanted to do for you. Um, the other question I have, and in, in so, you know, I do mixed methods, and I think some things are going to be traded off when you try to highly quantify them. Yeah. And I'm not against doing that at all. Yeah. Right? If it can be done well. But I think like your comments about like, oh, you know, some of these different pieces really overlap and it's hard to disentangle and they load. So I think like if you're familiar with administrative burden literature, there's like these three mm -hmm. different costs of administrative burden. And it's kind of the same critique, right? Yeah. It's like compliance, learning, all those kinds. They can overlap. It's very hard to disentangle. And so yeah. I guess I'm wondering what the motivation is um, for wanting to kind of invest in that, which I don't, like I said, isn't a bad thing. When, you know, I see this, I'm like, I would love to have more qualitative work, yeah. uh, right? That gets at this processing that's underlying where you could, you know, imagine you're combining these two methods to understand things that are about institutional context, like Mara said, like I totally get that where, you know, mm -hmm. I went to a non-fancy for undergrad and had Latina professors. And yeah. I think had I went originally to a place where there were no Latina professors, I think I probably would have said like, there's no way in hell I'm going to be a professor, right? Yeah. And so context and trajectory, I think matter. Yeah. And I think that is going to be what's very difficult to get at with, you know, strictly a, a quantitative yeah. approach. So I'm wondering how your team's yeah, so like the kind of the question is kind of like, sh should you even be doing this kind of, which I think we struggle yeah, with, from that perspective. or or like, uh, what's the what's the value kind of maybe in in trying to pursue kind of like this quantitative like exactness? Um, I think the this is something we struggle with a lot, um, and I think part of it is that we are um, like we're working with engineers, so like our next study is an NSF funded study that that uh, you know has all these engineers um, like involved in it and they understand this a little bit more like they want to see the average blah <laughs> score right and so part of what we're understanding is that there is something like compelling about like a number for people in certain positions and like administrative positions and you know who have certain orientations to science and so the question is like 
well, what does that number mean? So like when we show them the average score for aspirational capital, like we want to be able to say like it means this like specifically, right? And I think we also want to be able to take these things and combine them with social network analysis, which does, you know, require like like a variable that has a score, if that makes sense. Um, but like will we ever get to some kind of like conceptual exactness? I'm not sure. Like maybe we actually have to hyphenate these things, right? So like students score like five on aspirational navigational capital, right? So that uh, that we are being more explicit about the fact that these are not conceptually distinct and that it's okay that they're not. Um, that's how we've been presenting it so far because we get a lot of you know social scientists who say like, okay, so you basically created this scale and then you told me it didn't work. So, you know, why are you presenting? Well, because, you know, there's a there's a theoretical reason why it doesn't work, right? Like there's theoretical support for the fact that it doesn't it doesn't actually disaggregate. So maybe it's about the framing of our results and saying like maybe we need to hyphenate some of these things or present them as intertwined, like at the outset, if that makes sense. I hope that answers the question a little bit. Oh. So thinking about something like aspirational, so you're sampling people that are already in, in, in college. A P, and, and a PWI, right? Yeah. And so when you sort of talk about it maybe not working, it's so it, like and needing to add in the perceived barriers, I wonder if it's just the, to back to Mara's point, the institution, like they they have to be that inspirational if they're willing to come here, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, no, I hear you. Right? And so it's like, They've been selected to be at UW because they are so aspirational, yeah. right? And otherwise, they'd be somewhere else. And yeah. So it's not that necessarily this, you know, this scale you know, isn't working. It's just that, like, in this institution, you, you know, and that's why it would look maybe maybe it won't look different yeah. in a different set of institutions. But that's how I. That's it's not just putting in the perceived. To me, the perceived barriers doesn't quite work. Yeah. Um, People have told us this. Yeah. But but simply recognizing like. Yeah, to come here um, as a as a Latina or Latino, you have to have that level of aspiration because otherwise you'll never. Come. You wouldn't come. Yeah. Probably resistance too. Resistance. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting because this is something else we've grappled with with measuring quantitatively is that the original scale was created with Asian American Pacific Islander students in mind. So it was tested at an um, Asian American uh, Pacific Islander serving institution. And so we thought, do we have to have subscales for every single group that we are, <laughs> you know, uh, so like um, Latino students at HSIs versus Latino students at PWIs. Uh, it's, it becomes increasingly complex. And I think what we what we are trying to do kind of with this early, like really messy work is to give um, an opportunity to scholars who don't have the resources to just test and test and pretest and pilot test some kind of like base to start from. So that's why the aspirational capital uh, items, for example, are like quite generic and like may not work the same way in Texas. Yeah. Uh, I would almost say like, and I'm not telling you how to do yours, so don't think that way. <laughs> But like, if I was thinking of it, it's like maybe the, the right population for the piloting and the development is like yeah. high school seniors. Yeah. And not right. those that matriculate. Yeah. Because right? then you can get people going to a variety of places. Yeah. And seeing like if your aspirational capital predicts over time, like your. So. Well, and, and not yeah. even just seeing if like you're going to get more variation in aspirational. Right? Yeah. Because. because right. It's interesting if you don't, the students are selecting in community colleges because for a Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a great point. The other thing I was going to comment on, and I'm sure um, I know Ben's at WCER, and I'm sure, so I'm sure you've talked to like classical testing folks. Mm -hmm. um, but what occurs to me is that like, from this is like going back to my grad school days, when you think about creating a scale, um, it, like you don't have to have subscales, right? It could be just one big yeah. construct, yeah. right? Yeah. And that you have a variety of types of indicators that have differing levels of difficulty, but they yeah. they all function as one. So yeah. so I'm not sure, even if there are differences, I don't know what's added from all of the yes the subscales as opposed to just one big scale. scale. Yes, and we had a classical testing person at the School of Ed tell yeah. us why do you not have just one big scale? And the thing I'll say is like you know I'm here saying. There are no, like there are no significant differences. This is at the level of the subscales, 
right? Yeah. But by items, there were other significant differences. Yeah. So for example, like um, white students did not report feeling inspired by their family histories at the same level as students of color. So, um, but, but, but because the other items in that scale about kind of like your familial cultural uh, capital um, were not significantly different, we, you know, we say that they're not, they're not different. So I think there's a, there's a value in kind of thinking about the items um, as just like a big set together that are all measuring some kind of community cultural wealth. And we can maybe report differences between scores and items. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about your Texas work that is like super exciting to me. Okay. Because uh, my family's originally from RGV. So oh, okay. Yeah, RGV is in there. Yeah. Right? And yeah. also, you know, if you're talking to especially Mexican Americans who are in the Midwest, there's either that they recently immigrated, kind of first gens, yeah. or they were here for a long time. They immigrated kind of during like, you know, the Great Migration and going up to factory jobs. In the Midwest. Yeah. So, Texas offers it to me a really unique opportunity because it's a mix of all of those yes, things, for depending real, yeah. on where you select, right? Yeah. Even the RGB, if you go to the Rio Grande Valley, 30 years ago, any kid, Mexican-American kid who was born in the RGB was going to be bilingual. Even yeah. though they're now, that is not the case. And it is still like 85% Mexican. Yeah. So it's a really interesting context, I think, to study Mexican-Americans in this particular area. And mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that you will say, yeah. We have diversity in geography in Texas where you're selecting your sample because I think that could really help sort some of these questions out about like what does it mean to be here a long time or where you're from or things of that nature. You should get a lot of generational variation. Yes, yeah. I think we will. So we do have eight campuses that we're working with in the UT system. Um, I, my Texas colleagues always laugh at me because I'm like, oh, well, if you're in Dallas this weekend, why don't you just go to El Paso, like pop over? And they're like, no, we cannot do that. <laughs> Like, I did that the other day. I was like, oh, well, so you're just in Dallas. So then you could just, and it's like, no, you can't. It's actually quite different. But so we have UT Dallas, UT RGV, El Paso, uh, Permian Basin, Tyler. So it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a quite uh, varied um, set. And we are seeing some kind of interesting differences in proximity to the border in our interviews so far that we've just been discussing as a group um, into how, uh, how connected actually people, students feel to occupation, careers on across the border, right? thinking about themselves so like maybe they're not going to work in the U.S. Like maybe they'll work, um, you know, in, in Mexico and or maybe they'll live in the U.S. and they'll cross every day or they'll live in Mexico and they'll cross every day. So we had more experiences of just like thinking of the border as like much more permeable in terms of students' career interests, um, like, uh, at, like at UTEP, for example. Um, so, yeah, I think that there will be some interesting differences, but we have uh, the data are coming in like right now. So we have not looked at the survey data yet. And these are all STEM students also uh, in this, in the UT system uh, study. I just yeah. want to say that the work that you're doing, the kind of work that you're doing, you're, you're doing it in a time period where in different disciplines and in different ways, there is a desire to try to reinterpret or understand or how sacred cow theories can be adjusted to what's actually happening on the ground. So. We hear a lot of talks here, and there's, there's a common theme happening across, I think, disciplines. And so yeah. when you're going to within discipline to your, in hearing back from folks who may be real protective of scales or want to push back against why you think it needs to be altered, yeah. it's just part of what happens in a thinking group of people when the paradigm shifts. Good yeah. for you for sticking with it. So just hang in there <laughs> as okay. you figure out the magic properties of what you're trying to do, <laughs> because it's the time period you're in. Yeah. Yeah, welcome I appreciate it. Welcome to it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Because it, it does feel, you know, because I was like, we've had, yeah, and we've had senior people say like, what are you guys doing? This is a mess. So, um, and you don't know, you want to take some of that critique, right? Like some of it is a mess. And then, you know, but uh, I think it's worth, worth doing. So I appreciate that. The idea, like, things are true. Some yeah. of it may be a mess and changing paradigms is messy. Yeah. And on the other side, there could be more clarity. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Take you back to the kind of more the Bordeaux quote that you started with. Yeah. I was wondering, because that was really the way I always, always understood it. It's, the problem is the mismatch between what you're bringing and what the institutions value. So I was yeah. wondering if you're going to start trying to pull in measures from the institutions and, and kind of mm -hmm. see how those overlay with these. And now that you're doing the different groups in Texas. Yeah. Do you mean like thinking about like institutional measures of success and things like that, or or just like aspects of the institution. So you, yeah. I mean, you were talking about it as we were going to the Q&A about the different types of institutions. 
people are going to right. different groups, needing different sub skills. But yeah. I just wondered if there was plans to do that more kind of explicitly, is try to look yeah. at that overlay. Yeah, I think like something we're thinking about for so this is uh, this is this is a great point. Thank you for for bringing it up. Something we're actually thinking about that's related to this is uh, employers, right? So like we like st colleges all day can support students and like value their resources. We can teach students to this. So we've had we've done presentations where students have never heard of the CCW framework, and they've come up to us afterward and be like, "Oh my gosh, you think I can talk about myself in these ways in my cover letters?" or my applications to med school. And we say, sure, but we don't know, uh, we don't know what, like how it's being received on the other end. So like one, one thing we want to do for kind of our next step is to interview employers just to get a sense of like, especially uh, the major employers in Texas of the UT system students in STEM and to see about how they're evaluating students when they come in. Um, because it's possible that we can tell students, oh yeah, talk about how you cross the border every day at 4 a.m. to come to school in the United States, but your mom could not, you know, had to live, you know, across the border. And you, so you said, I'm going to do this because I'm not going to see my mom from 4 to 7 p.m. every night. So this better be worth it. And I'm going to work for Tesla. Does Tesla like that? Does Tesla value that or see that as, as useful? So um, we haven't thought about it as much with universities, which is a great point. Like maybe that actually should be our first step instead of. I think that's where you might find where you don't see a lot of different people in white students and students of color, but it's like, it's that interaction where, I wonder yeah. if the difference is like Yeah, yeah. Enough. Well, that's a great point. I wanted to piggyback on the employer side is that if you've already kind of mapped that out, I'm guessing you've already thought about this. But in a place like Texas, you know, you talk to employers in Dallas, it might be one thing you talk to employers yeah. on the border, it's going to be another. Really it's kind of exposure to and concentration of exposure to Mexican-Americans in Texas, and then yeah. like, you, you're going to find this, and you already know this. It's not a monolith. And so yeah. I would expect employers in, they might not be in predominantly white counties, if you're going by counties, mm -hmm. but they might be in counties that have a very large share of non-Latinos and have for a very long time and are yeah. wealthier. And I would expect those employers to potentially be much more resistant right, to that, because they might yeah. not see it. Like, the dominant culture is still going to, like, this idea that the, the dominant culture is going to, you know, be pushed aside if there's a certain concentration of folks of color. I think, you know, you want to think about that in terms of generations that have been there for a long time. Yeah. Um, by county, if you're going in Texas, because I would expect yes. that to look really different. Like, a cultural yeah. capital threat model. Kind mm -hmm. of like yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ouch. Yeah, that's but a great point. it's also, it's like, it will probably vary across the and that here I'm saying it's one big thing, but you know, some of the dimensions, right? So, like everyone loves them, not everyone. Dominant culture embraces aspiration. Oh, right. Sure. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. And may less so uh, value, uh, you know, the spiritual. Uh -huh. I don't know, I'm, not, I'm not making comments. <laughs> I just, right. And so that's where, yeah. that's where I think maybe the, the slicing, because there is some overlap with some of the dominant. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think like, the students, the sense we get from interviews is that students kind of know how to pitch themselves a little bit, right? So um, I think that's to that point of like, they're quite adept at using dominant cultural capital narratives as well. And so like in our interviews, some students remark on like uh, connecting to people who share their identity and their background, like both because that connection is supportive socio-emotionally, but also because that person is in a position of power. And so they've said things like, if I go up and tell my Professor, I'm also from this small town, you know, um, then he might give me a position in his lab this summer, right? Like they're very, they're very good at combining these two different things. And so maybe in a way it's, a, it's good to think about like, well, maybe they're activating certain kinds of narratives in their story that do draw on the forms of CCW that like the dominant culture would like, you know, appreciate more or something. Yeah, like they're framing their CCW in dominant cultural terms. Yeah, to, right. To leverage it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Any plans for the Texas A&M system? I'm a Yankee. Oh. Mainly, and yeah. the reason I think about it, we brought up employers, and my first job, in my first internship, like, it was very divided on, like, which departments had Aggies and which departments were from UT. Oh, really? And, and that well. was, it's, I remember you, and, like, we talked about it, like, you know, my wife, also an Aggie, you know, had, uh, apparently they would tease the one UT Department. Oh, no. She was just an intern, and so it was kind of part of her onboarding. Like, this is what we do. We knock down their stuff <laughs> every day. And I 
I had no idea. I'm still really learning a lot about Texas. Um, <laughs> so we're going to El Paso in June, um, which I'm very, very excited about. I'm going to take like a big suitcase and just like fill it with a lot of things that I would like to eat. Um, but uh, so we have had students in, um, in interviews talk about Texas Tech and Texas A&M as options that they had. Um, and why they didn't choose those things. And we also had a couple of students so far who's tr who have transferred um, from the a and system or the Texas Tech system. But we, um, I think what happened is that we uh, have been working through the UT system LSAMP, so the Lewis Stokes Minority Participation Alliance uh, in STEM. And so that is housed at UTEP, and then UTEP made all those connections for us. So, you know, I don't know how to make those connections in a and but that's interesting, I had no idea. Well, now I do, yeah, <laughs> now I do. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm, I'm not a sociologist, so this was all very interesting to me. Um, so you said the, the Texas survey is only going to STEM students? Yes. Yeah. Is, is there like another version or a plan for like humanities and social science? I work, I work for Constellations, which is a oh. humanities program. Oh, cool. Um, and like one of my personal missions is how we can like illuminate humanities careers for students. And yeah. I was thinking about like these terms that I've never heard before. Yeah. Um, Yeah. With like humanities and social science majors, because those careers are, can be a little fuzzier. Yes. Students, yeah. Um, whereas, like, I'm going to be a chemist or I'm going to be a biologist. Like, yeah. Are a little easier lines to draw. So. Yes. Yeah, that's a great. So, um, our first two kind of sets of students were from any discipline, but um, this next project is funded by NSF, and they are very specific. Like, we can't even um, ask about medical majors. So, like, we can't survey nurses. Um, because that's NIH territory, so they're very like, you know. Um, so yeah, so it's just it's like about the funders in this particular case. But it's interesting because I was just uh, in my class. I'm teaching a class on Latinos in U.S. higher education. So yesterday we were looking at all these great visualizations that MC has. I don't know if you, um, uh, MC is uh, they're um, uh, I think they pool data from. Um, like Burning Glass and LinkedIn to see like how people are applying for jobs. And they have these great visualizations from this report they put out two, uh, three years ago about how kind of your first and second and third job are much more mapped out if you're in STEM than they are if you're in the social sciences. So they see all this movement where a lot of students are taking a first like lower paid job out of the social sciences or humanities. And then they're slowly moving into what they call business management functions. So like consulting and sales by their third job. But um, uh, I think that's always really interesting to students. And I had this idea that like maybe in interviews we should be doing some kind of mapping of their career paths and like thinking about how they see themselves um, in you know five or ten years but we haven't really thought yet about how to incorporate like those shifting um, occupational interests so yeah. <laughs> so I guess this is kind of related do you have plans to follow up on the student outcomes yeah. graduation yes um, so we're funded for four years fortunately um, and so we're collecting data for three years. So we're following, um, they're, they're, we're doing like what, what's called a junior study in higher ed, whereas that uh, we get them like first in their majors, then them as seniors, and then either in their fifth year of college or graduated in grad school. So we'll see them for three, three years. I think like we might do two cohorts because we have some extra funding. So, um, but yeah, we, we will follow them and see what happens within five years, like within the five years of college. Oh, this is just for the Texas students. Yeah. So we only had funding to do one round for, for Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can't track lots of specifics, but it would tell you pay and it would tell you categories of right. uh, work. Yeah. Companies. Just a side note to that is we tried that on a project that was community college based in Texas. And it didn't work. Might have oh. changed. Oh, but Texas was not that many. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, like the state of Texas that was not. Yeah. Wow. Fair. Okay. Wow, that's really interesting. Thank you for mentioning that. Well, not, it's not worth trying again. Yeah, <laughs> I guess we could, we could try. Wow, okay. Oh my gosh. That's pretty serious. Well, 
let me thank you for a very engaging and wonderful talk. Thank you all for coming. Thanks very much.